It is good to have all our locations today, and we're in this series in the book of Galatians called Free at Last. Would you say it with me? Free at last. Oh, free at last. Thank God Almighty. I am free at last. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're studying a, a letter, which is now a part of the canon of Scripture. It's been preserved for a couple thousand years that... Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, which is a region that encompasses all of southern, modern southern-day Turkey. And uh, this letter was circulated to all the first century churches, and now we get to, to benefit from it uh, all these years later. Uh, if you weren't here last week, we talked about three areas of your life where God wants you free. And, and if you don't hear anything else today, please hear this. God has designed you for freedom, and he wants you to live a life of true freedom, Spiritually, mentally, financially, in every way, God is, is here to give you an abundant life and to produce freedom. And so we talked about three areas last week. If, if you weren't here, you can check out the podcast, videocast, uh, tfh.org. Um, we talked about God wants us to be free from religion, specifically dead religion. And that is when we take relationship out of the mix and we replace it with rules. So Paul was talking to the church of how to get free from religion, free from hypocrisy, God doesn't want us to wear a mask, get on stage and change our persona, but to be the real sincere you and to confront hypocrisy in your life and the lives of people you love, like Paul confronted Peter and it was to the face. And then he wants us to be free from the internal struggle of sin, something we all understand really well. And Paul said, man, the things I hate I end up doing and the kind of person I wanna be, I can't be, who will deliver me from this, this bondage? And we've, we discovered this last week's study that there's only one way to that freedom, and that is you got to take it to the cross. Uh, so today we're going to jump into some fresh content in chapter 3. Let me encourage you to get out your Bibles and notepad. There's a lot in chapter 3. If you've been reading ahead, which I would invite you to do, next week we'll be in chapter 4. So meditate, read chapter 4, highlight it. We'll be studying it next weekend. Uh, but as, if you've read chapter 3, you realize, man, there's a lot there. There's some theological mountains to climb. We're going to climb a few in the next few minutes. There's some Old Testament concepts, some, some stuff that needs unpacking. Uh, so we're going to do it today. It'll be quite a bit of content, but you're up for it. And he, here's what I want you to do is you, you receive what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Make sure you write that down. And uh, as we talk about quite a few areas out of chapter 3, uh, you're going to have to lean in, pay attention, and focus. Do you know the neuroscience scientists have proven that when you're listening to a lecture or a teaching that requires concentration, that while you listen, you're actually burning calories. Did you know that? Your brain actually needs calories. So just for a few of you here, but maybe, you know, you needed this, you're going to be losing weight while you hear me preach. So just, you know, I'm, I'm here for your benefit. You know what I'm saying? I'm on your team. So Paul uses some pretty strong language in chapter 3. He's like, Oh, you foolish Galatians who lay this hex on you, who bewitched you. Uh, some of the original words that are translated, some translators believe he actually called them idiots, which was a little rude. I, I try not to do that when I preach here at the Father's house. But the reason he did it is because they'd fallen into such deception. He's trying to get their attention with this strong language. It'd be like if someone you really loved was going down a road in their life of self-destruction. At first, you would try kindness and tenderness, and you would try to reason with them. But if they resisted that, at some point, you'd probably just grab them by the shoulders and slap them in the face. <laughs> Snap out of it, man. What are you thinking? And that's really what Paul is doing here uh, to the church at Galatia. Before we jump into chapter 3, though, there's a, there's a theme in Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and all the letters to the churches that really is the heart of what Paul's talking about today. And so I want to start out in the Word in Colossians 2.6. Here we go. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Just as you received him, continue to live in him. So in other words, finish like you started. And that is really the message to the Galatians. They started in the spirit. They ended up in the flesh. They started out by grace and faith. They ended up in the works and trying to earn God's favor. And so he's saying, hey, how did you get saved? Let me ask you that today, personally, all of you. How did you come to Christ? Was it your good works? You earned it? You studied enough? You understood some principles? No, if you are truly born again, it is because Jesus drew you by his loving kindness. He extended his grace to you. And because of that grace, you exercised faith. Now, something's true of everybody in the house. If you've never been to church, you've been here 30 years. Oh, wait, wait, we haven't been here 30 years. But... Uh, you have been given a measure of faith. So there's this God-given deposit, 
where you know, you know in your inner man that, that God is real, that his word is, is truth, even if you haven't wrestled through all the nuances. And so when you exercise that gift of faith based on the grace of God, you were saved. And so he's saying, I want you to remain and stay in the grace. Don't get caught up in rules and regulations. Don't get caught up in trying to earn your way in because you didn't get here because you deserved it. You got here because God loved you with unconditional love. Come on, everybody say, stay in the grace. Let's read Ephesians 2.8, shall we? All locations, bring this up. Let's read it out. By grace are you saved through faith. That was really quiet. Let's do it again with just a bit more intensity. And here we go. By grace are you saved through faith. That, not of works. So stay in the grace, stay in faith, and let's move into the word of God. The reason this is so important and Paul keeps driving it, he's redundant on this theme, is because this is the default mechanism of the human heart is trying to earn their way into God's favor. That pretty much encapsulates all organized religion. We're gonna climb up the steps and try to please God. Uh, here's a pretty amazing statistic. Recently, 52% of the evangelical Protestants that were interviewed said salvation is a matter of faith and works. The majority of Christians believe that God will not reject people, that is, keep them from heaven if they simply live a good life. So 52% of Christendom in America believes, hey, my aunt's a nice lady. She never hurts anybody. Truly, God has to let her into heaven because of the life she's lived. And that's not what scripture teaches at all. Are you with me? So Paul could say to the American Christians, who bewitched you? Who cast a spell on you that you think you can earn your way into God's favor? It's by grace and grace alone. So let's jump in. Chapter three, here we go. You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And he probably paused and let's, let's hear the response. Of course, I think, I think it was by hearing with faith. He doesn't let up on the interrogation. He says, are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? That means by human efforts. Did you suffer so many things in vain? Surely it was not in vain, was it? So then does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And the answer is clearly and obviously hearing with faith. I want to give you three ways in the next few minutes of how you can live a life in the grace of God. You can stay in the grace of God. Unlike the Galatians who started in grace and then they got under a yoke of slavery, of rules and regulations and trying to earn their way in. Three ways to stay in grace for you note takers. Number one is you gotta listen with faith. Can we say it together? Listen with faith. Now what is that? Well, you come to church and Dave's up here preaching a sermon or you're listening to the podcast and uh, you can get caught in a trap of just kind of checking the box. I went to church today, so I'm probably doing better. God likes me a little more. I went to church, yeah, two, three weekends in a row. Woo, gold star. And you can hear lectures and teachings and sermons without ever exercising faith. See, faith is leaning in with anticipation and expectation that what is being said applies to me. I believe in it. I trust in the promise of it. And when you listen with faith, it creates some amazing things in your life. But how many you know the letter alone kills, but the Spirit gives life? So just hearing a bunch of words or you know, religious teachings does not change us. It is through faith. So we got to lean in and hear what God is saying. Hebrews 4, 2, for indeed the gospel was preached to us, that's the Christ followers, as well as to them. He's talking about people who look like Christ followers are started in faith, but they fell away. And here's why. The word which they heard did not profit them. The word means to benefit, to advance their life, enrich their life. Why? Because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. So lean in in faith, because today I'm going to tell you some good news. The gospel's good news, Amen. So I'm going to tell you today that the gospel was preached to you 430 years before the law showed up. You are God's plan A. I want to tell you today that you can live above every curse and every trap of the enemy because of what Jesus did on the cross. I'm going to tell you today that you are sons and daughters of Abraham and you're called to live in the blessing, to live in the overflow, to bless people around you and to bless all nations. So while we're going into the word and studying scripture today, Let's exercise some faith and listen in faith in Jesus' name. Amen? 
So you got to listen in faith. The second way to move in the grace, let me read Galatians 3, 6 through 9. We'll find it in here. In the same way, Abraham believed God. Uh, that is, he heard the promises of God and he, he actually had confidence they'd come to pass. And God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scripture looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. Toward the end of our time, I'm gonna talk about what the blessing of Abraham is and how it applies to you. But just one point I wanted to bring out of these verses is this, that the gospel was preached to Abraham, proclaimed to Abraham long before the law ever showed up. Now you guys remember what the law was. Moses, the 10 commandments, ended up being over 600 commandments as the Pharisees and scribes elaborated on the laws. But for all those centuries before the law came, God said, the gospel is this. It's every tribe and every nation. Now, this might not apply to everybody, but probably a few of you have thought, well then, what's the deal with the Jews being the chosen people? I thought God chose Israel, chose them to be the covenant and to fulfill his promises through a select group of people called the Jewish race. And it's true that God has made covenant promises to national Israel that will be fulfilled, but never to the exclusion of Gentile believers. See, the reason God chose Israel is this. I want to show my covenant. I want to show what loving and keeping the commandments and walking with Yahweh will produce in a group of people. But his goal was always to bring every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And so the Jewish people were to model what it looked like to walk in covenant. But those of you who've studied this, you know what happened. God makes the covenant, gives them the commands. A thousand years later, Jesus shows up as a baby in Nazareth, grows up, and he's in fact the Messiah. And when he presents himself to his own people, they rejected him. It says he came to his own, his own did not receive him. But God wasn't like freaking out in heaven going, oh no, <laughs> they reject the Messiah. What are we going to do? We lost the chosen people. We, we need replacements. What about those Gentiles? Foul little people, but they're going to have to do, right? <laughs> that, that's not the way it played out. I want you to know that you are plan A. That it's always been Jew and Gentile. It's always been the cross of Jesus Christ as the entry point to knowing the Father. It's always been about the bride, amen? And so that's the truth that Paul is bringing to these believers. Galatians 3.10 says, but those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, curse is everyone who does not observe and obey. Here's a key, caveat, a key. All the commands. So Old Testament, here's how it worked. If you didn't keep all the commands, you were guilty. And no one could keep all the commands. But the commandments were never given to see who could be the most righteous. Do you know why they were given? To show us that we needed grace and they were a, a guidepost. They were, they were pointing people toward a time when the Messiah would come. It was all a temporary system to make God's people right until Jesus came on the scene. Uh, Cursed is everyone who does not observe all the commands that are written in the book of the law. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Now, in the last couple verses I, I just read to you, this is the crux. This is the heart of the gospel. That there is a curse that's on the planet because of sin. And God didn't just show up one day and say, hey, you know, we need to bless some people and we need to curse some people. So line up and hopefully you get in the right line. The curse of sin entered when? When Adam and Eve fell. When sin entered the planet because of man's free will, the curse of sin, which was carried out through the law, fell on humanity. In other words, when sin entered the world, the ground was cursed. Adam and Eve and their sons, they had to work harder to reap less because of the curse that was on the earth itself. Bible tells us that women were cursed because of the pain of childbearing that came after the fall. And all the moms said, oh, that's right, talk about that. <laughs> you know, relationships were cursed because of the fall. There was envy and jealousy and divorce and betrayal and ultimately murder because of the curse of sin. And then the planet itself is under a curse. 
I mean, and you know, fight global warming and recycle and do all the stuff, but this world is decaying because of the curse of sin. So God comes through the law in the Old Testament and through the cross in the New Testament, and he provides a way that you as sons and daughters that say yes to Jesus can live out from underneath the curse. Now, in the 21st century, American Christians, we clearly don't understand blessing and cursing like the Jewish people did. I mean, if you think about cursing, maybe your first thought is what people do when you accidentally cut them off on the interstate. And hopefully you don't do that to them. And if you do, you're growing out of that because the fruit of the Spirit is working in your life as I speak. But anyway. (laughs) Or what golfers do when they hit a shanked bad shot into the woods. I'm going to talk about myself. Pastor Shane there at East Bay. Just stretch out your hands. (laughs) But for the Jews, they knew what cursing and blessing was all about. Because God set up a system and and there was this moment in the history of Israel that I want to point your attention to where God said, today... I'm going to give you a choice, and you're going to choose life or death. You're going to choose blessing or cursing. And the same choice that he gave them in the Valley of Shechem one day is the same choice that he's giving you. God doesn't force salvation on us, does he? But he gently draws us. And he says, in the valley of decision in your life, where you're right now, I'm asking you to choose life. But you can choose life or death. Here's the way it played out in Deuteronomy 30. Today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and who? Your descendants might live. I just gotta take a time out on this one. Every parent in the room, lean in. Every parent, all locations, lean in. Your decision to whether or not you will serve God, be in his house, be faithful to his word, just doesn't affect you, but it affects your children and their children and your descendants. He said, if you will choose life, that the blessing will be on you so that you and your offspring and your descendants might live. Remember that day that God drew a line in the sand for Joshua because half the nation was worshiping idols and there was a portion of the nation that wanted to follow Yahweh and the true living God of Israel. And so Joshua says, hey, here's the line. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But then what did he say next? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Every dad in the room, listen. When you make a decision as the priest of your home and you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know what you're doing? You're setting up your wife, your sons and daughters and your grandchildren and their children to walk in the way of righteousness because the blessing on your life goes down to your descendants. Hey, I don't know about you, but I came from a long line of alcoholics. Anybody else? I came from a long line of adulterers in my family. Study my family tree. It's a scary place. You don't want to climb it. I came from a long line of poverty and poverty mentality. But that's not my inheritance. That's not my future. Why? Because Christ came to me and said, I will give you an opportunity to make a decision. You can either follow your granddaddy who died at a young age of alcoholism. You can follow your descendants that went through two, three, four, five marriages. Or you can say today and for the rest of my life, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And by God's grace, I made that decision at a young age. I made a decision I would stay married to my wife for the rest of our lives. And by his grace, 36 years this summer, I made a decision I'd raise my daughters in the house of God, my grandsons in the house of God. I'm saying, whatever generational curse is on you, you can break it. Whatever poverty chain in your family, you can break it. Because you have an invitation to say, as for me and my house, enough is enough. Enough anger, enough abuse, enough drug abuse. It stops here. Why? Because the blood of Jesus is breaking some chains. That's what he does. Come on, take the off-ramp out of that junk. (laughs) All right, not on the notes, but my, that was refreshing. So he leads the children of Israel to this valley called Shechem. Now, Shechem is a valley that runs from east-west, and on the north side of the valley, which would be over here, was Mount Ebal. Mount Ebal was the Mount of Cursing, okay? But on the south side of the valley was Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. In fact, I have a picture of this. Check this out. So the uh, Valley of Shechem, uh, two million Jews would line up through there and up against the slopes of each mountain, And then there was representatives chosen from six tribes and six tribes that would stand on Mount Ebal uh, to the north and Mount Gerizim to the south. And here's what they would do. 
they would speak out blessings. Now, scientific research has been done on the Valley of Shechem, and here's the deal. It's a natural amphitheater. It's one mile wide. You can stand on one side and shout, and people can hear you clearly on the other side. So God said, here's what's going to happen. I want everybody to stand in the valley, and the blessings and the curses are going to be pronounced. But this wasn't like a glib, God bless you, have a nice day, the Lord be with you. These were pronouncements that would rest on the people of God and define their future and their destiny. And they would call out these, these promises or call out these curses. And here was the caveat right here. Look at Deuteronomy 28. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands I'm giving you today, the Lord will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. So those were the conditions to live under the blessings that would be shouted out from Mount Gerizim. And I want you to get this today because this is real. And here's, lean in, here's the deal. You're either gonna live under the blessing of Jesus or under the curse of sin on a fallen planet. There are no other options, all right? The curse of sin is gonna land on somebody. It's either gonna land on Jesus, who already paid the price, or it's gonna land on your life. You can dodge the curse of sin. You can delay the curse of sin. You can medicate the curse of sin. You can be in denial about the curse of sin, but it is gonna land on somebody. And when these selected blessors and cursors stood on these mountains and declared the blessing. They actually landed on the children of Israel and that was their heritage and their destiny based on their decision. So I'd like to illustrate that real quick and other locations you can just lean in and shout out the blessings in just a moment, but we're gonna illustrate it here in Vacaville. So everybody in the center section, lift your hand, center section, all the way up to the rise, way up top, way up against the back, all you guys good? Okay, you're the nation of Israel, okay? You're gonna either receive blessing or cursing today, all right? Now, uh, you are my Mount Gerizim over here. You guys, are you good? Mount Gerizim from this aisle over. You're my blessers, okay? Get ready. You're gonna speak some blessing. And over here, I'm sorry, this is just where you choose to sit today. You're in the north, man, okay? You're Mount Ebel, so from this aisle over, you're my cussers. Everybody good? You're my cussers. Someone's saying, that's awesome, man. It's good. My wife's great at this, but that's another counseling session. All right, and I just wanna show you uh, what this looks like and the weight of it and the truth that is being communicated here. So could I have all my Mount Gerizim people just stand? I won't embarrass anybody, I promise. Just stand your feet, all Mount Gerizim. And we're gonna do something together. Would you look over toward the children of Israel in the Valley of Shechem? This is the Valley of Shechem right here. We're just gonna speak out a couple of blessings straight out of scripture with some passion. They're gonna come up on the screen, ready. Here's number one, ready, go. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Next one. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and your breadboards. <laughs> oh, time out. How many of you want your bread baskets and your fruit boards blessed? Oh, you know you do. Don't miss that blessing. Come on, one more with passion, all locations. Here we go. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. Come on, we bless you today. We bless you. Now here's the deal. When those words were spoken, they landed on you and your offspring and the fruit of your womb and your crops and your animals. It was a permanent blessing. You guys, let's give it up for Mount Gerizim. Well done. Well done to all my priests. Way up high, we got priests way up high. Way up high. How are all my cussers doing? <laughs> now, we're not gonna do this part, you know why? I'm just afraid it might stick. So we ain't gonna be cussing people out. You're gonna have to get on, on the 80 to do that on your way home. <laughs> but let me show you what the cussing looked like, Deuteronomy 28. However, if you, if you do not obey the, the Lord God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You be cursed in the city, cursed in the country. Your basket and kneading trough, cursed. Fruit of the womb, cursed. Crops, cursed. Calves, cursed. Herds, cursed. Lambs, cursed. You be cursed when you come in, cursed when you go out. Oh, man, sucks to be you. <laughs> right? That's just all levels of bad news. But remember, this wasn't God just waking up one day and going, man, we need to damn some people. We need to curse some people. Let's, let's line some people up. No, the, the curse was already here. And he was implementing a system whereby his people could live out from underneath it based on a choice. Back to the New Testament. The curse of sin is already here, you guys. You felt it. 
If you've ever wrestled with anxiety, if you've ever been betrayed, if you've ever been involved in an adulterous affair, if you've ever had poverty issues and bankruptcy and rage and abuse and all, all that is the fruit of the curse of sin that is on this planet. And God says, but today I give you a choice. You can choose life and no longer old covenant, keep the rules, new covenant, come to Jesus, receive by grace. And remember what it says here in 13, Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he was hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing, for it is written in the scripture, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Second way you stay in the grace, lean in. Don't carry the curse. Don't carry it. You, you have a, a choice to make. I'm not talking about just one-time salvation. Because see, some of you have confessed Christ and you say, yeah, I'm a Christ follower, Dave, but then you fall back into a trap, you mess it up, you know, you sin, you go through a month or two and, and just stuff in your life. And we have a tendency to go, well, I just have to carry the shame for a little while. I don't deserve to be in my small group and I feel too bad to come to church. I just kind of waller in. You know that God has called you and invited you every time you mess up, every time you sin, 1 John 1, 9, 2, 1. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, because Jesus took the curse, we can keep a short list of transgressions and sins and things that separate us from God. His desire for you today is nearness. If you fall, get back up. A righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. Why? Because he understands that Jesus, now here's the theo theological caveat here, he became the curse. Actually, Jesus on the cross. And the, the Jewish people couldn't wrap their mind around it. You see, in their understanding, anyone on a cross, that was the greatest disgrace, and you were cursed by God himself if you hung on a cross. So to think that Messiah would come and be crucified, they just couldn't embrace that. But yet, there was a revelation that Jesus wanted to give to them, and here's what it was. It wasn't his sin that took him to the cross, it was ours. He wasn't taking the curse because of what he had committed. He was taking it for all of us. So this is the gospel, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. In Galatians 3, 22, the scripture declares that we're all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus. In just a couple moments, the band's gonna come and we're gonna go to the table of the Lord together. And I, I wanna invite you today, as we recognize his shed blood and his broken body and receive the emblems that are in your lap right now, that Jesus took it all. Listen, he took the shame so you don't have to carry it. He took the guilt so you don't have to carry it. He became the sin so you can be free of yours. There's this illustration in the Old Testament. Once a year at Yom Kippur, Passover week, the priest would take two young goats, and on one goat, they would lay their hands, and the word is transmit or impute is a biblical word. It means actually put into this goat all the sins of the nation of the year. Then they would sacrifice the goat, and its blood would be used to atone for. Without the shedding of blood, there's no removal or remission of sin. And then there was another goat. The priest would lay their hands on this little goat. <laughs> They'd lead him out to the wilderness, never to be seen again. He's called the scapegoat. So when Jesus comes, he becomes the once and for all perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. All of the, listen, everything I've ever done, you've ever done, humanity has ever done was placed into him and upon him on the cross because only his pure and perfect blood could be the once and for all atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. This is the gospel. You don't add anything to it. You don't add works to it. You don't add religion to it. It's all Jesus on the cross, arms outstretched, saying, I'll take it all. And all you gotta do is come to me, come to me. All you who are weary and beat up and carrying religious burdens and trying to earn your way up the ladder, forget all that. Come and say, I received the finished work of the cross. And in that moment, you're saved. You go from death to life, darkness to light, bondage to freedom. You get to dance a little bit. You get to have the joy of the Lord, feeling good on a Sunday morning, traveling light, boom, three point in the spirit, net, boom, like that. It's all been done for you. You just got to say yes to him. Amen.
Finally, band can come up. Live in your inheritance. Live in your inheritance. You have one. Galatians 3.16, God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. Notice the scripture doesn't say to children, as if it meant many descendants, rather it says to his child, and that of course means Christ. Verse 26, for you all are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism, put on Christ like putting on new clothes. I love this, lean in. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen, the cross abolishes discrimination. The cross abolishes racism. The cross abolishes prioritizing one nationality over another, male over female. It abolishes it. God says you are all one. It's not based on your hereditary genes. It's not based on IQ or gender, nationality. He says in Christ you are all one and you are those who receive this inheritance. Final verse, and now that you belong to Christ, you're the true children of Abraham. These Gentiles couldn't wrap their brain around it. They've been like the despised, unclean Gentiles. The descendants of Judaism wouldn't even eat dinner with them, wouldn't even go into their house because it would make them ceremonially unclean. And now Paul's coming and saying, wait, 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 no, no, no. You are the true children. You're the sons and daughters. You're the heirs of this inheritance. Why? You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So you lean in for a minute longer. God makes a promise to Abraham, preaches to him 430 years before the law and says, I will raise up descendants and you're gonna be a blessing to many nations, but all of your inheritance is going to one child. His name will be called the Christ, Jesus from Nazareth. And all of the inheritance was in Jesus. And when you come to Jesus, you are the recipient of the inheritance of Abraham. Now that might not mean much to you this morning. Anybody got any wealthy relatives that are gonna leave you an inheritance? You're afraid to raise your hand because I'm gonna hit you up for cash later, but I get that. Listen, I don't have any wealthy relatives at all that are gonna leave me an inheritance that I know of, unless they're tucked away deep in the mountains of Arkansas, but I'm, I'm not counting on that. But can you imagine if you get up one day and you go out and there's a certified letter to you from your great-great-granddad Abe, and you realize that you've been given this amazing inheritance? but it's sealed up in this certified letter. But all you have to do is open it first and read it. I'm talking about your Bible if you haven't figured that out. And in that certified letter, it says that you have an amazing inheritance. All you have to do is believe it and confess it and stand and receive it. But you know, hey, I, no, I'm too busy, you know? I'm working my way up. I gotta go dig a ditch so I can pay my rent and gotta try to be righteous and do some self-help and go to my yoga class and be a vegan and just keep stacking it all up. None of those things are wicked and evil in and of themselves. Maybe veganism, we can talk later. But anyway, <laughs> eat some cheese for the glory of God. And, and you're skipping this huge inheritance and God says, you, 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 you're the sons and daughters of Abraham. And the promises I made to Abe, they belonged. Well, what did God promise to Abe? Because I want in. How many of you want in? I just want in. This last verse I'll read, Here, here's what it is. Genesis 12, 2, here's what God said to Abraham. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. This is God's covenant. If you listen with faith, if you say, Jesus, take the curse of sin in my life, then you start living like who you really are. You're a son, you're a daughter. When I got this, when I wrapped, I was raised with a poverty mentality. I was raised that you had to earn God's favor by keeping the rule. I was raised in that garbage. And somehow by God's grace, he broke that off my life. And we started the Father's house, we made a decision 21 years ago that this church would live like sons and daughters of Abraham. We would be a blessing to the nations of the earth. And you, my friends, listen, every year channel millions of dollars to missions and church planning and other ministries. Why? Because we understand who we are. I'm not a reservoir, I'm a river. I'm not here to get what God can give me. I'm here to live with an open hand and say, God, 
flow through me because I'm a son of Abraham and the blessing that rests on him, it's resting on my life because Jesus went to the cross. That's what Paul's trying to tell these Gentiles. And if you're under that bewitching that thinks, I don't deserve it, well, of course you don't. <laughs> Not judging you, just, you know, you probably don't. If you think I don't deserve it, no. But in Christ, you deserve all of it. The grace, the favor, the prosperity, the blessing, the covenant is in Christ. The valley of Shechem and the blessing from Mount Gerizim is in Christ. The favor is in Christ. Your future is in Christ. Is anybody here today? So let's receive and stay in the grace. Get in the grace and stay in the grace in Jesus' name.